Welcome back to this latest episode of Japan's Top Business Interviews. I'm your host, Dr. Greg Story, President, Dale Kana Yutoku Training. It's our fourth year of the podcast. My special guest today is an old friend of mine, Ryan McAvoy, who is the President of Japan Media Services and a, an acclaimed and award-winning filmmaker. Ryan, you have won how many awards now? I mean, I've lost count. I mean, I see the stuff on social media, but I can't keep up. How many have you won? Coming up on 15. And awards. just got nominated for one in Brisbane, which I'm super happy about because obviously that's where we're both from. Yeah, hometown. So Brisbane, yeah. I don't know in fact, it. you're the first Brisbane boy apart from me on this podcast. So there <laughs> you go. That's a historical moment. Well, we've got a few things in common. Brisbane, karate. Yeah, that's right. I don't know if the folks out there know, but Six Dan, quite yeah, amazing. Yeah. And Maya Sensei was your... Rival. Rival. <laughs> which it's, it's amazing I'm even talking to you after yeah, I know. that rivalry. But, <laughs> but, you know, the film... Just we'll talk a little bit about the film. Um, it's a documentary and uh, the ones left behind and it's about the plight of single mothers in Japan. And so just to make it transparent, I am actually have a cameo appearance in this movie and I talk a little bit about the context uh, in Japan, society, politics to give some you know broader spectrum to what's happening with these single mothers. But... You know, you have been in Japan how many years now? Coming up with 20. 20, right? And you've been running your own business for how long? As well, I started filmmaking in 2007. Right. And it's a long full-time time. business from 2000, end of 14. Right. So obviously today we're going to, we're going to talk about leadership. But, you know, um, winning so many awards, it's such a, an incredible topic. You know, what, why... Do you think the world needs to know more about this? We can plug the, 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 the documentary a little bit here because it is, I mean, I've seen it a number of times, obviously, and of course I'm in it as well, so that's the main reason you should watch it. But apart from that, it's a very, it's a very important topic. So what's the key point here? Well, firstly, uh, I haven't thanked you enough for being in it. Uh, you say cameo, but it's a very key part because um, you, you help tie up everything mm -hmm. by delivering and you were the one who told me the stats and I said well that's exactly what the film needs and mm -hmm. I asked you would you mind you know would you mind to be in it and you're amazing in it as was everybody else um I didn't know anything about single mothers beforehand I didn't even know Japan was a poor country um there's actually a word for it in Japanese where everyone thinks Japanese are middle class and above and it's really not true it's smoke and mirrors, you know, it's, mm. they're really not. It's uh, a lot of people struggle all over the world. There are a lot of people struggling. Well, I'm sure a lot of people watching this video would not know that one in seven children in Japan are living in poverty. And this is the single mother syndrome, mm. right? So uh, it's an important topic. I, I encourage people to find the documentary. Where, if they want to watch it, where can they find it's it? It's still not available in the public yet okay. because I'm negotiating with cinemas at the moment. Are you? Oh, right great, now. Great. So great. hopefully that'll go from Hokkaido right down to Okinawa. Good. Soon. We're just fingers crossed. It's such a long process. It's a bit of a sensitive topic though. You know, Japan's it's a, it's not a, a great country for really opening up the kimono and showing the not so positive sides about Japan. Right. So uh, I guess that's been a bit difficult well, too. We, we've talked about this before, mm. but you know, being a foreigner here, it's, it's, it's easier to touch the taboo subjects. The concept of wa mm -hmm. can't be broken. Mm can't be broken here and why meaning harmony harmony mm. and what it means to be japanese mm. and and a lot of them don't want to touch that and mm. taboo subjects are totally off limits but here comes i you know a uh, uh, early 40s caucasian white gaijin male here and just breaks it all open and says you know what this needs to be spoken this needs to be mm. talked about mm. so again you're great in it you're really great in it <laughs> i don't see my uh, entree to hollywood or even bollywood <laughs> as uh, being a spin-off from this but anyway thank you so let's let's talk a little bit about you know you are a filmmaker a documentary filmmaker you have your own uh, videography business uh, you recently came back from mongolia uh, sato island before that so you're, you're getting around with but the uh with the acl with your acl, ACL yes injured. you injured your injured your knee and your training so um what are the issues around someone in your role as an entrepreneur, you have your own company, you're using a lot of contractors to help you do things. Now, when you have full-time staff, leading them, you've got a lot of authority, you've got a lot of power over those people. Uh, 
of course they can quit, but you know, contractors are just contractors, right? And so we're going to talk a little bit about leading that group and the difficulties of leading people who are not, it's like leading without authority almost, you know, in that sense. I mean, there's whole, we have a whole classes on how to lead without authority, but just your experience of that. So when you're putting together a project and you need to get a team together and probably each project has a different team, although I'm sure being Japan, you tend to probably use people you trust and there may be repeaters there, but let's, let's yeah. just go with it. So how do you go about getting a team of contractors engaged who probably don't know each other. Uh, they know this is a project, it's gonna end, it has a finite ending. How do you get them engaged to be part of your company for that period of time and do a really professional job? What has worked for you to get them to do that? First of all, we always get given a budget mm -hmm. and that's usually the client's budget. Mm -hmm. And then we have to decide who do we need for this job? and how do they fit into the budget? Mm -hmm. And sometimes there's a lot of, well, unfortunately this time we only have this amount. Can you do it? Mm -hmm. A lot of them say, yes, fine, no problem. Uh, sometimes I'm like, sorry, there's not much budget here, mm -hmm. you know, and we have to search for other people, but. Well, those who say yes, they've obviously they've accepted the price. Mm -hmm. That's one thing. But how do you get them engaged to do a professional job in the work? Well, they're professionals to begin with mm -hmm. and they want repeat work, mm -hmm. but as the director, it's kind of like leading a company, I suppose, but you have to be the one that they all look to mm -hmm. for some kind of inspiration. Mm -hmm. You have to be because it's got to be your vision, mm -hmm. right? Um, and you need to be able to, especially with a group of randoms, you got to be able to bring the group together quickly mm -hmm. and be able to accomplish something that you could do, yet you couldn't do on your own. Mm -hmm. We'll just come back to that quickly part. So okay. how? Do, what have you found works to bring a random group, uh, you know, a collective of people who don't know each other, don't know you probably all that well, to bring them together, engage them. What, what have you found works well? Got to be professional from the beginning. Yourself. You yeah. have to be. You have to have everything ready. There's a lot of times I've got to sets and it's been an absolute nightmare. Somebody absolute else's nightmare. set, obviously. not Someone yours. else's set, not mine. Mm -hmm. mine, is, mine are always super professional. And that's mm -hmm. the big thing they say about ours. It's like, oh my God, this is, you've actually got a time schedule. Mm -hmm. So I make sure everything is done right before I get to set. Mm -hmm. So it should be like clockwork. Mm -hmm. At this time, this happens. This person mm -hmm. comes. I'm like super detailed. It's all in the details. Mm -hmm. So when I make that daily schedule, mm -hmm. every minute little thing that you got, you got to plan it ahead of time. Mm -hmm. And you have no idea how many sets you get to. And they're just like, oh, well, whatever. He'll come around this time. And then what happens then is... This is Japan. In Japan are we supposed not, to be no, on time? No, yeah. no. This is uh, Japanese. Are some of, I don't want to know if I should say it, but some of the worst at this, really? at planning. Really? And then when you get there, people start talking behind your back. Right. Because nothing's planned. It's like, well, what's this guy doing? I've been on those sets where, you know, right from the very beginning, the mood's like, oh... This is a disaster. This is, this is not, this is not going to go well. And then, and then you got to deal with... Sometimes you got to deal with talent who are prima donnas, mm. right? And if things don't go exactly to plan clockwork, then mm -hmm. they start complaining. They let their managers know about it. And so. so this this high degree of specificity, planning, detail, is that a result of from when you first started, you maybe weren't doing it that way, and then you discovered, oh, geez, if you don't get this stuff right, it's hard to get people to follow you, or nothing works well. Is this a, a product of experience? Or did you start like that? Are you just a picky, detailed-oriented sort of guy? This one. <laughs> it's just since I was doing, since I was doing the short films, I used to be at ALT here. Way back in the day, when in my young, my early so an ALT, is ALT is an assistant, assistant language, language teacher teaching high schools, junior high school, junior high, or even better, junior, junior high, high school. school, Japanese junior high school kids, yeah, where they used absolute to fall, worst fall asleep. Group. I used to go up to them and I say, "Hey, I don't want to be here any more than you want to be, but that doesn't mean I can sleep, does it? So wake up." And they'd wake up every time. But anyway, I, I digress. <laughs> I had a lot of time because we only taught four classes a day to make all these schedules. Right. So I would spend most of the time, I don't sorry to say to the government, but on the government's time to make these schedules. And I just got in the in the process of making detailed mm -hmm. schedules for the day. Mm -hmm. It's super important. You're you're planning as a film director, you're basically just putting words of a script onto the screen. You can have mm -hmm. your own vision, mm -hmm. but you gotta have everything has to be mm -hmm. set, ready to go, and it just goes smoothly. Mm. And the difference is chalk and cheese. I've been on, like I said, some terrible sets where it's been, who's running this show? And then some guys were like, oh my God, like Japan Media Services, you guys, you guys have a, a detailed schedule. Mm. We even know when we're going to, we even know what we're going to get for lunch. 
you know, we make sure, you know, like, you know, we give them options as well. Because these days you got to be careful, like vegans, yeah, not yeah, vegans, exactly. you know, and this kind of stuff. Gluten, like, also stuff. gluten all that, you know, and, yeah. and that helps when you have Japanese stuff, you know, working for you, mm -hmm. which I do. And they come up with all the fine details as well. They help me out. So mm -hmm, like, mm -hmm. it's not a one man team, like, you know. Well, I, also on that, you know, you talk about the director has the vision and has to have the, the professionalism of how things are run logistically. But I guess also it's a very uh, creative industry you're in. There's no, it can only be one way type of thing. I'm sure there are many ways. And I'm sure that the, the, the group who are working on a project are also capable of inputting their ideas because they've probably been on other projects. They've got a lot of experience in the industry. So you're not just drawing on your own resource mm. of, of insight and knowledge. Right. What have you found works well to get ideas from others into the project? Uh, this is more case by case. There are mm -hmm. some directors who just, it's my way or the highway. Okay. There are some, mm -hmm. and they, they don't care what you have to say. Mm -hmm. I'm not one of those. Okay. The single mother film, I take the accolades because I shot it and I directed it and I edited it, but that's a team mm -hmm. thing. I mean, I had input from a lot of people. Why don't you try this? Why don't you do that? Mm -hmm. um, I, you need to be able to listen to good ideas, but at the end of the day, it's your project. Mm -hmm. So you take the ideas and you say, hey, that works. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a good idea, but in the back of your mind, you're like, no, sorry, that's not that's not this. But So it comes back to your overall vision. Mm -hmm. But you do need to be in, to be in, make people feel like they're part of the team. And do you, I mean, in that sense, do you tell them, for example, you're assembling a crew, uh, it's a project, a particular film you're shooting or documentary or commercial or whatever it might be. Do you tell people, look, um, I really encourage you to contribute your ideas on this. Which we're all working on this together, or uh, not? How do you? No, do you because generally creatives are that type type of people. Oh, they're going to volunteer anyway. Volunteer information generally. Right. Okay. Um, right. Especially if I'm not shooting it and I'm just directing, then I'll like input from the cameraman a lot, the DP, what mm -hmm. what his ideas are, because a lot of DPs, directors of so photographies, the director of photography, all this, all this. Sorry. The cameraman, <laughs> they're selected on, on the way they shoot. Right, okay. Um, I actually personally like to shoot everything myself, mm -hmm. but then sometimes that doesn't look good in front of the client. It's like, okay, mm -hmm. why is he doing both? Where's the director? Mm -hmm. So sometimes, you know, you have to step back and just be the director. Mm -hmm. I like doing both. Mm -hmm. um, I've had a camera in my hand since my, my dad put one in my hand to film his Aikido classes right. when I was 11. Mm. You know, so I mean, martial arts, and you're a martial arts, martial arts and filmmaking have always been one and one. I've always done both at mm -hmm. the same time. Mm -hmm. So um, coming back to your point. Well, the getting ideas from getting people, ideas. Mm. Are, you, are you spontaneously asked, but what you're telling me is that they volunteer anyway. Mm -hmm. they, because they're in their creative business, they are putting their hand up. You can't come across as a Hitler. Right. Because then people sometimes might feel a little bit, right? You really have to come across as someone who's open. Mm -hmm. And I generally am open. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not so up myself to think that I'm the greatest filmmaker ever and what you have to say doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a team game. Definitely mm -hmm. it's a team game. Mm -hmm. And it's got to go smooth, mm -hmm. especially when the clients are watching the monitor, mm -hmm. right? And they don't, not only watch the monitor of what you're filming, they watch everything and mm -hmm. they feel the tension, mm -hmm. you know? So if there's any tension between the crew, they're like, what's going on here? So mm -hmm. it really has to be, I, th I find that doesn't happen. Be, why would there be tension between the crew? Is this personality conflict? Is this just nervousness? What is that? That both, and it could be that uh, perhaps there's been some kind of argument on on, on the shot. Okay, mm -hmm. he likes his shot, but I don't like that shot. Um, mm -hmm. Generally, I try to avoid all those arguments, and so mm -hmm. I just say, "Well, we'll get both." Because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, I have always have final cut. You're editing it. Right? I have final cut. Yeah. yeah. If I'm not editing it, I'm standing there editing yeah, it. Right. Yeah. So. You know, and generally you find when you get to the editing room, it's it's actually, oh, yeah, actually that works. Because you, you don't know what's going to The magic is in the editing room. Mm. And generally, you know, it's I, I, I'm pretty laid back. That might be my Australian Australian Queenslander in me. I'm pretty laid back in that kind of way and mm. try to collaborate with as many people as, as possible. But mm. it does have to be your vision in the end. Mm. Especially because the Japanese, when they say kantoku, kantoku-san, kantoku-san, like the director, yeah. right? You're right up there. You're on the pedestal mm. for the Japanese. It's like sensei in, in Japanese. Mm. Right? They revere the sensei quite a lot. Well, I guess too in the in the film industry too, that hierarchy is very clear and people fit. And I remember I was um, doing a part-time job. I was doing a, a film shoot, still film shoot on the Gold Coast on the beach. And uh, the... Director was a short 
mustachioed Japanese guy. And the uh, second camera assistant was a huge young guy. He was a monster of a big guy. <laughs> and he dropped a canister of film on the sand. So this is back, obviously, is, in the 90s. because Yes. Yeah, no one uses film anymore. Yeah. yeah. This, well, it was a film. It's still film at that time, okay, right? Yep. And uh, this little director reached up and just clipped him under the ear, whacked him in the ear and abused him for dropping the film canister because the sand may have scratched the yeah, film. Yeah, I don't yeah, know what the hell yeah. he belted him for, but I was like, the, wow. They're both Japanese? Yeah. This yeah. is a very Japanese thing. Yeah, I was like, wow, that's pretty over Even the Even in those days, that would never happen outside of, um, I mean, they'd get angry. It happens all the time. Even in Hollywood today, they get super angry and they go on rants. But physically hitting, that's that's a Japanese thing, 100%. <laughs> well, it was at that time anyway. Yeah. So I was like, whoa, okay. So that's how I realized the hierarchy of the film crew. Well, I know where I know who my boss is and the boss is always the producer. Mm -hmm. The producer can fire you anytime. Mm -hmm. And if mm -hmm. they don't like what you're doing, you're out. And they get another director in. Right? And they'll use the same crew. Mm -hmm. So, Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. They steal the crew and yeah, get rid yeah, of you. Yeah. Okay. So in terms of, uh, you know, uh, building trust, again, you mentioned before about you have to be very, very professional, which gives them confidence in you. But apart from that, what other things have you found work well to build trust in these sorts of uh, ensemble teams of contractors who will coalesce together for one project, perhaps? What works well? You mean trust with the client or trust, trust with the team? Trust with you, mm -hmm. particularly. I talk about you are the you're the lead here, so mm -hmm. you've got to get them to trust you. Right. The client's got to trust you. Everyone's got to trust you. Right. What do you find works well to get trust with people? It's, I've kind of already touched on it, but you you have to you have to show leadership capabilities mm -hmm. on the day. You can't be seen as someone who's second guessing. Mm -hmm. You have to be. You, you can't show weakness. You have to be, this is the way it's going to be. Mm -hmm. But you have to make sure that they're part of the team. Like I said, you have to mm -hmm. include everybody. It's, it's, that, that's basically it. You, you, you can't second guess anything. Mm -hmm. You got to know your stuff. And that's all the planning that we do beforehand. And so just having that schedule on the day is not planning, right? It's the whole, it's, it's the shot list. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the images in your head that you want. Like you have to know. Anytime you second guess, you lose, you lose confidence. You lose, you lose that trust. Mm -hmm. If you're second guessing any decisions on the day, it's okay to go away mm -hmm. with some of your trusted lieutenants and say, okay, this has come up. What do we do? What do you think we should do? Mm -hmm. And you can talk about it that way, but you know, not, not in front of everyone, especially not in front of the actors or the, the client. Mm -hmm. so. And who would be your trusted lieutenants on a film shoot? Well, that would be the, the, the staff that you use. You know, and you, you get to know them after you use them a, a certain amount of times. Okay. And, so yeah. these what are camera people? Camera. Are, well, you, you would have sound a... Sound um, or whatever, yeah. You'd have a, well, you have sound guys, you have a lighting team, you have your, your DP, your director of photography, and you have your producer, right? And it's generally the producer, the cameraman, DP, and yourself would perhaps go away. Sometimes the producer's not even on set, you mm -hmm. know, but you, you just go away and you make that team team decision. But at the end of the day, you still have to realize at the end, it's, it's your decision, it's your name on the line. Whatever happens, it's, it's you're the one who's making that final decision, you know? Um, you have to be confident. You have to be confident to be able to lead that team. Hmm. And I guess, you know, you, you've got, as you say, you've got a very detailed schedule here of things that got to be done. But a lot of trust building is done uh, before the project gets going in terms of the initial offer to come on the team. And also over things like breakfasts and lunches and dinners, you know, I've, I've been an interpreter, liaison person for film shoots in Australia when I was younger. And uh, we We'd go off, you know, like went with Tokoro Georgie to a shoot uh, in the Barrier Reef, you know, wow. and you're, living, you're living together. Um, not that I was in his room or anything, yeah. but, you know, <laughs> I could see him. Yeah. That's about it. But, you know, so you're with the crew and you're living together. So, you know, you're spending a lot of time after filming together to, again, build that relationship. But I, I wasn't the leader. I was just a paid liaison person, paid pretty well too, i got to yeah. tell you. Good, good. With, Good. Pretty good dough in those days. Yeah. But um, I often thought, well, yeah, there's a lot going on outside that heavy schedule. Mm. You know? Do you look for opportunities like that to, when you're bringing people in, building the trust to get them to come on board uh, while they're there outside of the actual key tasks they've got to do? Mm. Anything happens there for Well, you? I really like that Japanese concept of uh, ski -ai. Mm -hmm. You know, building time outside of, of, of um, the job. Mm -hmm. You know, I had to write a report on that when I was um, 22 for Griffith University. 
that was my first ever essay I had to write on ski I I totally bombed it because I, <laughs> I just looked up the dictionary what ski I means and I wrote what I thought it meant but I had no experience in you know apart from a year teaching English in Japan at that time but I came to learn ski you know the bonding that goes mm. goes on and the team building that goes on the team building is very important um, with your crew but also with your with your actors whenever I meet them I always meet them for a coffee first mm -hmm. if I'm using them. And I never ask them about the job. We never talk about the job ever. We always just talk about them. Mm -hmm. Okay, where are you from? If, I, if I've never met them, where are you from? You know, how long have you been in Tokyo? Because a lot of them moved to Tokyo to mm -hmm. find the rags and riches, the, from the rags and riches story, you mm -hmm. know, to be that famous mm -hmm. actor here. And, mm -hmm. and then you could kind of try to get to know them and try to, you know, because they're also looking at a gaijin. Mm -hmm. And he's like, oh, wow, this guy is, you know, he's this because they would have looked me up and they would have seen I'm a, a pro wrestler as well. You know, this, mm -hmm. wow, this pro wrestler is speaking great Japanese and I'm really nervous and mm -hmm. make him, you know, make him feel comfortable and talk to them about anything not related to the job. Mm -hmm. Then you throw it in at the end, you know, with the job. Okay, this is what we're doing. Mm -hmm. Do you think you can play this kind of character? And, you know, and if it's a commercial job, well, the client is this and they're requiring this from their actors and. And you you build it up, you build the trust up. I think before you get to mm -hmm. the set, and mm -hmm. so everyone knows what they're doing basically. Mm -hmm. Every, you you steer the, the ship, but everyone's got to know what they're doing. And what about the sort of the ski I, that that relationship building during the project? Or anything particularly you found works well there? Um, what works well there? Well, Japanese love to to drink, um, and you'll find that in the business world. In any world, mm. they they love to drink. Karaoke is a great one, mm. especially Can you Japanese. Sing? Yeah, I sing. You're I'm always the icebreaker. Ah, I always the icebreaker go first. because I, I I'm not much of a singer, but if I find if I break that ice, it breaks the ice for everybody, but it also breaks the ice for me. Yeah. I, I break got, the room. Yeah, that's yeah. <laughs> I clear the when I start singing, I clear the room. So I, don't bring me up first. Yeah. <laughs> I went. I was singing Japanese. I got three songs that I can do in Japanese. Okay. Otherwise, that's it. Uh -huh. And I start with Linda Linda by Blue Hearts. Okay. And it's a high tempo song, and it gets everybody upbeat. Uh -huh. And they're probably still ordering their alcohol at the time, uh -huh. and they're all still really nervous. We've probably done a day of shooting uh -huh. already, so they're a little bit tired, uh -huh. and they're wondering how they went, you know. And they want to. Everyone wants to try and talk to you and find out how was it, what did you think of it, and that. But just you know, some some of these uh, ski eye techniques. They're very they're very good, <laughs> I, I believe. If you want to be successful as a leader, do the Leadership Training for Managers course. All companies need people who can both manage and lead. Leading people screams out for real skills in communication, dealing with all different types of people, being excellent at innovation, planning, delegation, handling mistakes, doing performance reviews really well, and inspiring and motivating the team. Do the Leadership Training for Managers course now in either Japanese or English. Are you doing business with Japan? Do you really know how things work? Japan Business Mastery provides the answers. Do you have the right networks and know how to create them? Do you know how to get on the same wavelength with Japanese buyers? Do you know what being trustworthy looks like from the Japanese perspective? Japan Business Mastery is based on more than 30 years experience in Japan and will become your go-to guide. Want to succeed in Japan? Buy Japan Business Mastery now. <laughs> yeah, well, It can be as much as dinner though. It doesn't have to be yeah, you know, yeah, drinks yeah. and karaoke, but yeah, yeah, yeah. take care of your stuff. Uh, definitely take care of your stuff, the yeah. biggest thing. And um, what about culture? Now, Normally, we associate the culture concept with with firms, with companies. But uh, as a as a leader, you emanate culture. You are the one, as you say, you're determining the direction of the organisation, what type of culture you want, how you want people to treat each other, how you want relationships to work out, how we communicate with each other. So when you think about, again, these are contractors; they are there for a project but you're trying to create a work culture project by project. And I would presume it's always going to be, I'm guessing, the same type of culture you want and you try and replicate that because that's the one you think mm. presumably is the most successful. So what have you found works well to build a culture in that work team for that particular project? I think we've already covered it, but just 
be professional and open to advice. I mean, mm -hmm. th they all come there with their professional hats on. Um, there have been a couple of times when I've had to say, hey, enough of that. Like, for example, enough of what? Someone said something out of line. You know, critical of someone else. Critical of someone else. Critical um, of you. Never critical of me. <laughs> um, actually, there was one time that was critical of me, and I had to put him in his place like straight away. Right. And I'm not comfortable. Even though you know, I've been doing martial in, arts in public. In public. Wow. Okay. And behind doors, I'm not really comfortable in that. You know, I've been like I said, lifelong martial artist like yourself, but I'm do I do martial arts because I'm not a confrontational person. Mm. When push comes to shove and you have to use the techniques that you've learned, mm -hmm. fine, that's no problem. But mm -hmm. until that moment, I, I don't ever want to confront him. But sometimes it just has to be done. And mm -hmm. there's been a couple of times actually, yeah, where I've had to, you know, for the sake of the team, the mm -hmm. sake of the overall, yeah, the culture of, you know, the I would say the fwinky, the the atmosphere mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. of the set mm -hmm. is pull someone aside and say, hey, that's not on. You know, enough of that. You and know. in that sense of, like, for example, I ask you specifically, do you say something publicly in front of everyone or do you say, need to speak with you, let's go over here, case away case. from everyone and have that discussion? It's case by case. If there's a, there was, there's only happened once, the, a, a niggling, niggling little comments day by day by day and he was kind of upsetting the whole team. And then, you know, I just, I had, I just couldn't take it. You had enough. I just had enough and I said, Mate, you know, it's Australian. And I find, well, this person was, I won't say he was, he was North, North, North American. North American, okay. But when you use um, mate, it puts them out a little bit because they're not, I don't think, well, Americans are not used to being called mate. That. Mate. I was like, mate, come on, please. Yeah. Enough. Yeah. You know, and, uh, but other than that, sometimes it's just, you just pull them aside and say, look, like, you know, I've heard this. Really, that's not on. Let's just get back to work. Let's focus. But then you know in your mind that you never use them again. Right. That's it. They're out. Done. They're done. Mm. And uh, a lot and of guess, people are scared of that, by the way. They don't. They they want to be used again. So it's right. there. It is very rare you get, but they are a little. You got nip it, nip it in the bud. Yeah, nip yeah. it in the bud. Because I mean, the whole thing around handling uh, difficult people, uh, handling mistakes, etc. These are all you know quite real problems. So, for example, um, how do you handle mistakes? You know, when people make an error. I mean, we had the example before on the Gold Coast beach there of the minuscule director reaching up and clipping this young guy under the ear when he made a mistake. I was like, whoa, I don't think we can do that anymore. I don't think we could do it then either for that matter. But how do you handle mistakes? People, you know, people might drop equipment or knock something over or um, they, they do something wrong or they get the wrong order or whatever it might be, you know. How do you, how do you handle that? If it's an equipment thing, our stuff is all insured, mm -hmm. so it's generally not a big deal. It's just a pain in the butt because mm -hmm. it delays everything. Mm -hmm. um, if it's a big mistake where someone's forgot to bring something on to the on to the set, it's like, well, go back and get it, mm. and then you have to go back and think, okay, we don't have this equipment with us. Mm, so what can we do in the meantime? Something else. Yeah. Sometimes we can't do anything. We just mm. have to wait, and I have to brunt the anger of the client. And but there's no point taking it out on on the person who's made the mistake because they already feel bad enough as it is. Mm. I hope I would hope so. Mm. I mean, generally they're very apologetic, mm. and I just have to say to the client, "Look, this is what happened. I'm really, really sorry. Mm -hmm. um, we'll fix it. We'll, we'll we'll get it taken care of." Mm. Um, you kind of have to be ready to take. That's the one thing as a director, and especially as the you know, I put two hats on as the producer because it's my company that we're, we're, that's taking the job. Is you kind of have to be the the sponge in between. Mm. You have to take that anger if the client's ever angry. Japanese clients are generally generally pretty good though. They don't, you know, they're good at they understand those kind of things. Um mm. when, you, when you asked about overcoming challenges mm. on the set, the biggest one that I have trouble dealing with is when someone comes and for example, we have our set right here and someone comes and says, "No, you should put the mic over there." But they have no idea. Like they they probably never touched a film in their life mm. you know and but they come and they want to be they happened at a very big job that i did um he goes i had the room chosen out for this lovely interview i had it all you know lit very beautifully and it was beautiful it was it was the client loved it and this guy walks in and says well i don't like this room why don't we go to this room and do it here and it was this tiny little room with, with no bigger than six mats Mm. And it's like, uh, and I just had enough by the end of the day. I just said to my producer, I said, can you take care of him? I just walked out. 
because just didn't didn't want to deal with um and that, that's a very specific japanese specific thing i found and mm. you know when i did a couple of the jobs in australia we never we never had that problem but sometimes you get the odd guy who thinks he knows a little bit more than than he does and you just that, that that's why the team's important on that point you know you're an australian i'm an australian we're a laid-back culture pretty much right easygoing culture so i'm wondering too you know uh I'm guessing that probably an all Japanese set is probably not going to be laid back. It's not going to be no. that chilled mm -hmm. sort of Aussie atmosphere. Mm -hmm. So part of that culture thing we talked about before, I mean, do you, do you bring that to it so that when they work with you, it's quite a different atmosphere and a different cultural mm -hmm. feel for them than working on a maybe a bit more tense, uh, a bit more hardcore, mm -hmm. all Japanese mm -hmm. set mm -hmm. where hierarchy is very important. And, you know how people deal with each other is pretty fixed. Right. Is that something that you've found that okay, I I bring an alternative culture or a differentiated culture for these workers that they enjoy? Because in my team's case, I'm the only non-Japanese person in right. this company. Mm -hmm. But this company runs as a foreign-based company, even though we're not a Gaishke company. Technically, we're a, a KK here, a local company, but okay. it's run like a Gaishke, like a multinational company. And the sense of the atmosphere, how we work, how I run things, is based on mm -hmm. what I like in mm -hmm. terms of the culture of having, you know, open, fair, you know, a lot of flexibility, um, give people opportunities don't scold people if they you know screw things up and you know different way of approaching a very aussie way of doing things and I, I think one of the reasons people stay here is because they know if they go to um maybe another type of company could even be a north american company might be a bit more hardcore or a japanese company definitely going to be hardcore and they get something different for the experience of working here now these are full-time employees in my case but i'm just wondering for yourself in your case with these you know um, contractors whether that's something that's a an advantage for you i use a mix though but generally we're known as the company that uses mostly foreigners that's kind of the sales pitch that we say. Oh, in terms of the crew. Crew. Ah, okay. We okay. um the only Japanese guy I use actually is a lighting guy who's absolutely amazing. Um and he's got his own team that he brings. But otherwise we're known as, you know, we're we're the they have this word we talked about the other day, but the, the guy kujin no mesen. Yes. The foreigner's eye. Right. And we see things that Japanese don't see about Japan. We mm -hmm. see it differently. Mm -hmm. It's just like, for example, um, you know that lion statue that's usually outside of a temple? It's Koshi or, or more, okay, outside of a temple, yes. The yes, statues. Yes, yes. I love those. Mm -hmm. And I come around it with the camera like that and I, and I splice it in whenever I can. It's just something like, it's just one of my things. A Japanese wouldn't blink twice at it. They wouldn't even it's look twice at it. Too it's too obvious. It's just, too obvious it's just in their face. But then when they mm -hmm. see it, they go, okay. Oh, okay. So that's how foreigners see see it mm. and um and they also know when they get there that when they see all these foreigners around things are different it's just a given we're just mm. just being foreign for the japanese client it's enough um this is for the client side i'll talk about the team in a second but just enough when they see the foreigners they go okay this is this is going to be a different day you know my sound man is is um look a couple of sound guys one is american one's uh kiwi mm -hmm. and then my the other dp if i'm not shooting like he's australian or sometimes i'll use an american and it's not it's not because it's not a language thing. I have no problem communicating with a Japanese cameraman. I just prefer the way that we Westerners shoot things. It's just my personal preference. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess if the differentiation is the the approach on the filming, this Mason, this eye line, or mm -hmm. this how you see it is a differentiable advantage, then it's useful to have people who've got the same context and mm -hmm. can understand, yeah, that we're going to do it like this. They get it, I, right. I suppose. Mm -hmm. It's a bit like probably why Japanese don't like working with foreigners because <laughs> it's the reverse problem, right? Because the foreigners don't get it right. and they don't get the same line. And it's always like, eh, got to explain to them everything. You have to be flexible and knowing being bilingual, mm -hmm. uh, being here a long time, understanding the Japanese, but still having my, my gaijin touch, mm -hmm. I find is very helpful. Mm -hmm. And Japanese clients really like that. Mm -hmm. um, we're completely different to Japanese film crews, mm -hmm. and the way that the Japanese shoot is completely different. Mm -hmm. It's hard to put into words, mm -hmm. but um, just the clients know when they see it. They mm -hmm. they just know mm -hmm. that the way we shoot is different. Mm -hmm. um, the atmosphere on the set is is usually very different. Um, there's a lot more laughter, 
and there's a lot more. Yes, got it. You know, when you nail a good shot, mm -hmm. when you nail a good shot, people are high fiving each mm -hmm. other. And go, Great, good stuff, mm -hmm. mate. Yeah, that works really well. Awesome. Mm -hmm. You know, and and then you find when the Japanese see that some of the other crew, they open up a little bit more, mm. right? And they go like, "Oh, you're cut," and mm. they start getting in there. And a bit more communication. A little bit more, yeah. You know, and I'm always very vocal and trying to communicate with everybody. Mm. Um, I guess you know that's uh, when you say you're vocal, communicate. What what does that mean? Are you are you giving praise to people during the job? You say lighting's fantastic. The way you set that up, and the, I see it now. In the replay, wow! I really yeah. thank you. I mean, is that what we're talking about? What are we talking about? Yes. So you have to be you have to be communicative to the staff, but also the people in front of the camera, especially the actors, because they're mm -hmm. um, for some people who display so much confidence on the screen, mm -hmm. they're not all that confident off it, mm -hmm. and so they they require high praise. Mm. And um, also, well, that's interesting because I guess we only see the edited version, yeah. <laughs> right? The perfect version, yeah. right? Oh, they require high praise, high praise. Oh. Um, and how do you handle the prima donnas? Um, as long as they're professional, it, it, it's okay. And mm -hmm. but I, I've only ever come across a couple, and I always just ask Japanese staff to take care of them. All right. Um, <laughs> generally, they're not prima donnas. To, that, that might be the little gaijin card that we have. Right. They're generally not prima donnas to us. Okay. Right. Um, generally not. No, it's. Mm. And as far as being communicative to the staff, it's like, uh, well, you have to, like I said, always the whole thing is you got to have your vision. And then you say, can you change it a little bit more to get it like that? Can you, can you just get it a little bit more like that? And then, oh, that's not working. What do you think? How can mm. we get it like that? And mm. then he'll come across and go, well, we'll try that, try that. Yeah, mm. that works. Excellent. Mm. Great job. And um, I'm going to plug Del Carnegie for a moment, if you, if you don't mind. Oh, my right. father. Oh, I think I'll be okay with that. <laughs> my father put this book in my hand when I was in high school. This is how and, to win friends and influence yeah, people. And um, made me read it. Mm -hmm. I got bullied for a little bit, actually, because they were like, how to win friends and influence people? Are you some kind of Nigel? No friends? You don't have any friends? <laughs> but they didn't because they just read the title. They yeah. didn't understand. But I think the Japanese title is, is better. It's how, to, it's how to move people, right? Yeah, Hito Ukase. This, this character behind us. How to move people, how to make people uh, work for you. Mm -hmm. And I always find that saying their name mm -hmm. multiple times mm -hmm gets them on board mm -hmm. and it's like great job kenji yeah kenji san that was awesome mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and when they hear their name mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. this is just a little technique that i picked up from from the book when i was in high yep. school yep, yep, yep. you know i remember quite a few things but that was the biggest one you know mm -hmm. like making people want to work for you mm -hmm. there are techniques and i recommend everybody read that book mm -hmm. um it's Me one too. Of, it's one of those, i know you would but <laughs> it's one of those books you can pick up put down mm -hmm. come back to chapter to chapter every mm -hmm. now and then and mm -hmm. uh, but the big thing was the name the naming mm -hmm. thing and mm -hmm. how to make people come together mm -hmm. to move in the goal that you want right mm -hmm. and that was the biggest thing is uh, praise and their name mm -hmm. is that that i have got that right yeah absolutely is, yeah, you have yeah i have absolutely got that have, right yeah. from and what about uh, if someone was being sent to Japan? They say, okay, you know, you go to Japan, you can run the organization there. And they said, hey, you know, Ryan, I'm being sent to Japan to run the organization. I don't think about Japan. I don't speak Japanese. You know, help me. How can I be successful yeah. as a leader? What would be some advice you'd give them? It took me a long time to understand that I will forever be a guest mm -hmm. here. It's not super important to be fluent in Japanese, but at least make an effort. Mm-hmm. You know, um, don't be one of those foreigners that's been here 10 years and can't order coffee. Mm. Um, we've all come across those kind mm -hmm. of people. And it just shows... My cousin was one of those. <laughs> it just shows a lack of sincerity to be mm. in Japan. Um, mm. you, you should be able to say the easy stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and to be a leader here, just try to understand that working in Japan is it's unlike anything. It's its, its own mm -hmm. beast. Mm -hmm. um, and they should probably come to you, <laughs> come do some of your courses, perhaps. I <laughs> think they should too. Understand, yeah, um, mm -hmm. understand, you know, that leading in Japan, le working in Japan itself is a completely different monster to, mm -hmm. you know, in good ways and bad ways to any other work environment that you will be in. What's the bad ways? Well, the, the overtime, mm -hmm. the working until you're dead mm -hmm. culture. Um, I had one guy tell me that he could bust his butt and get everything done by five, but then by the time he's ready to leave, he'd just get more work to do. So he would go out and he'd, you know, go take a cigarette break and he'd come back and he'd go drink some coffee and he'd just spread it out over the day because he knew he was going to get swamped anyway. And, and it was the social face. Mm. 
mm-hmm. of leaving on time is unacceptable. Mm-hmm. I mean, guys, cares like foreign companies are probably different. You know yeah. more about that than me. Yeah. But the Japanese companies, they're getting a little bit better. Mm-hmm. But um, you know, we talk about this in the film, by the way. <laughs> um, you know, mm-hmm. the mothers, especially. You know how mm-hmm. wow they're sh- looked up, looked upon. Mm-hmm. Um, it's how, generally how are they looked upon? Well, you're a woman. My God, like, mm-hmm. you don't expect to try and get up the. You know, oh my God, you've had a kid. Mm-hmm. Oh no, you're going in the, you're going in the mummy course. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I find maybe the foreign companies are a little bit more acceptable, but we have mm-hmm. a, here in Japan, we have a long way to go to accepting. Um, better working conditions for for women, especially, and letting them ra- get up the ladder, the corporate ranking, mm-hmm. giving them more chances to do so. I mean, the women you featured in the film are single mothers, so mm-hmm. they've got the whole responsibility for the economic welfare of the family, the mm-hmm. care of the mm-hmm. children, the education of the children. The whole works on their shoulders. But as you say, still for companies, how they deal with working women. Um, how they encourage women to come back. Uh, these are you know, anyone who's running an organisation here. Uh, I have found that women are very, very capable in Japan, and there's sort of an undervalued resource oh, totally. from the mm. Japanese company yeah. side uh, point of view. But from a foreign company's point of view, you know, we grew up in societies like my my daughter's in Australia. Do I expect her to be treated like a second class citizen because mm. she's a woman? Right. Am I going to put up with that as yeah. her dad? Yeah. And if I have that mindset. Why would I then differentiate that from how I would see women in the business world in general and maybe try and be supportive? So uh, I think, as you say, for leaders to look, I would suggest, you know, there's a lot of fantastic talent, probably underutilized in many mm, cases, I think, totally. in Japan. And yeah. just because women are having children, I think there's now more of a an opportunity to come back to work than there was certainly any stigma or any um, societal pressure. I think that's really changed. and. Mm. With maternity leave too, it's quite generous, yeah. uh, relatively, I think. I've got one of my teams coming back from maternity leave in November and she's disappeared for about two years. Do you get any government grants for that kind yeah, of stuff? Yeah, okay, yeah, see, that's yes. a good thing the government yeah. is doing. Yeah, that's right. It makes mm-hmm. it a bit easier. Mm-hmm. And um, so what else would you suggest for someone who's t- turning up in Japan they've got to run the operation here? Enjoy the country. Mm. You got to fall in love with it. To, to, well, you told to me you went to Sado Island, which I've oh, never yeah. been to. And you said that was just spectacular. It was absolutely beautiful. So Sado we should Island. all we should all make the trip. Well, Sado Island was this. Um, you should totally make the trip. Sado Island. If it wasn't for Sado Island, Japan wouldn't be what it is today. I can say that confidently after being there. And the reason is, is because they made ten percent of the world's gold. They mined ten percent of the world's gold in the 1600s. Really, ten percent. Wow. And uh, Japan, as it, the country itself, mined twenty percent of the g- world's entire gold. Like Marco Polo called it the country of gold, uh, Japan, the country of gold. And you know, it really was. And that mine itself was specifically. Well, they have two mines. Well, they have about thirty, but two main ones. Um, one is uh, the old-fashioned go down the mines, and the other one is they were mining it from the river. Mm. And it's still gold there today. I went there and mined a tiny little piece of gold myself. You but could retire. <laughs> well, not really. It's probably worth a, <laughs> it's a bit, 20 bit yen. But, you know, the entire Tokugawa shogunate, they took over that mine. And as soon as they found it, they took over it. That was theirs. And that funded basically the whole Edo period. Wow. 250 years of peace thanks to the riches of, of Sado Island and some of the other ones around here. It was mm. absolutely beautiful. It's stuck, it's, lost in, it's stuck in time. Really? You know, it's, it's like going back in time. Going so. back in time, you know. So, okay, enjoy the country. Enjoy the country. Yeah. So if we were going to um, think about your definition of leadership, what would that be? Be resilient. Mm-hmm. Be resilient in the face of adversity, but be resilient in the belief that you have in yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, if you're not seen as a good leader, if you don't show those demonstra- those leadership capabilities, no one's going to follow you. Mm. No one will follow you. And which particular capabilities are you thinking of? Well, confidence, mm-hmm. um, being able to bring someone up when they feel down Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. likewise if um they're out of line Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. put them back down in their place Mm -hmm. um because we're running a ship here Mm -hmm. right and i may be the captain Mm -hmm. but you know you you can't be um you can't have crew members that are are no no mutinous crew members but you also can't be there's that famous saying if i'm not captain of this ship i'll sail alone well that's not a leader that's not gonna work is it no that's that's you know but there are people like that um, especially in the film industry, it's you know, it's my way or the highway. Right. I'll never, I'll never be be that. Um, resilience. That's how my my word for today. I think resilience. Be resilience. resilient. A resilient leader. Okay. You know. Well, on that note. Thank Ryan, you. Thank yeah. you very much. And please join us again 
for our next episode of Japan's top business interviews. <laughs>